1989. For the Oral History Project of Historic Madison, our interviewee is attorney William Bradford Smith of Madison, Wisconsin. I am Lorraine Orchard, and Bill and I are visiting at his home on Robin Circle in Madison. There are several reasons why our committee is eager to have this interview with Bill. For one thing, he grew up in Madison and attended schools here in the 20s and 30s and went to the University of Wisconsin. He has recollections of the Doty School area and then the west side area surrounding West High School and Randall School. He also has been in the private practice of law since returning from military service in the Air Force during World War II, served on the City Council of Madison during an exciting time, among other events, the opening housing, open housing ordinance was passed and the Monona Terrace Auditorium project was a heated issue, and Bill had a lot to do with both of these projects. He has been active in the Republican Party and has observed its changes in philosophy. He has served in the Wisconsin Congregational Conference for years, including the time of the merger with the Evangelical Reformed Church and the organization of Fairhaven, the retirement center, center in Edgerton, Wisconsin. It will be interesting to talk with Bill, so we'll start right now. Bill, tell us a little bit about your family and your neighborhood from your childhood. Um, before you uh, resume, since it's uh, near the end, do you want to go back and uh, pick up that uh, uh, white water instead of Edgerton? And, uh, uh, just carry it from then on? No. Okay. I, I think right. I will just correct it right now, Bill, if that's all right. Fine. Well, that should, Fairhaven is in white water. Fairhaven is in white water, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, what about your family? Were they early settlers, late settlers, or when did they come to Madison, do you know? Uh, my dad and his family came to Madison in, I think, 1889, when he was 10 years old. His father practiced law up at uh, Hammond, Wisconsin, and then moved down to Madison to practice here. His mother was one of the original suffragettes and a leader in the uh, Women's Christian Temperance Union, Mrs. Marcia Alice Bradford Smith. And uh, they lived here from 1889 on until he ran for governor on the Prohibition ticket in 1900, and then later moved to Chicago and practiced law in Chicago. He died in 1913, so I never uh, knew him uh, myself since I wasn't born until 1918. Um, what does the Bradford come from? Is that our historic American family, Bradford? Uh, right. Uh, the uh, longtime governor of the Pilgrims, uh, William Bradford, uh, brought a keen, um, uh, straight walking stick over from uh, uh, England. Uh, on the Mayflower, and he gave the cane to his eldest son, and he to his eldest son, and on down through about seven generations, until there were no eldest sons anymore, just two daughters. The older daughter inherited the cane, but offered it to whichever of her sister's two sons first had a son named William Bradford. So I was born in 1918 and inherited the cane, incidentally. You have it. Wonderful. I, I still have it, yes. Good. Well, then, um, where did you live in Madison? Uh, until I was 10 years old, uh, we lived on Main Street, uh, where the Methodist Hospital parking ramp is now located, uh, in a house long since torn down. Uh, then in 1928, we moved out uh, to the Randall School area, right across from the Randall School playground. Lived there from uh, 1928 to 35, 
and uh, then in 1935 moved out to Mineral Point Road across from what is now Covenant Presbyterian Church. Good. And can you remember anything about e any of these neighborhoods? Any What stands out in your mind? For instance, the Doty School area? Yes, uh, certainly I... I attended uh, school at uh, Doty School the first uh, th about uh, five years of my uh, education. As a matter of fact, at that time, uh, uh, well, the Doty School building was very much uh, uh, the way it is now, having been converted into condominiums. But uh, back in those days, the Law Park Drive did not exist. The Railroad tracks were right along the edge of the, the uh, well, the present location of the railroad tracks, but uh, uh, during the Depression, that area from the Blair Street area, the old uh, depot area, down to Doty School was pretty much of a hobo jungle, with uh, 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 hobos uh, cooking what cooking they were doing on sterno stoves and so forth. Uh, nobody would walk along the uh, shoreline from Blair Street to down to Doty School at all. That was uh, pretty much just uh, railroad tracks and the hobo jungle. Um, there is an historic home still there, I know, that used to be the Bond home, and now it um, it's something that got preserved. Do you know which one I'm I, talking I, about on Hamilton? Yes, Beautiful I think, home. Uh, I think that uh, Bond home was uh, relocated on that triangular lot uh, up closer to the corner of uh, Wilson Street and Henry and uh, Hamilton and uh, uh, is now occupied by the State Architects Association. Oh, There's a uh, new building now under construction, a huge new apartment building down uh, right close to the railroad tracks uh, facing the lake on the other end of that block where there was a uh, parking lot that has now been taken over uh, by this new apartment building. Well, anything particular about Randall's school, <laughs> which uh, I also attended and as so many of our interviewees, and they've attended Doty School right. too, it's interesting. Uh, you would uh, recall that Randall's school was both an elementary and a junior high school until the fall of 1930 when West High opened. Of course, I can remember my elders talking in 1928 and 9 about how foolish the school board was to build that new high school way out by the cemetery. Well, of course, it's uh, now uh, one of the closer schools to the uh, Capitol Square. I know it. I remember that discussion, too. What are, how are they ever going to have enough students way out there in the boondocks? Right. And, of course, <laughs> when West opened, it was both a junior and a senior high. So uh, Leroy Luberg was uh, a uh, general, uh, was a geography teacher in the fall of 1930 uh, and eventually became uh, principal of West Junior High and moved on up to become one of the outstanding university administrators for many years. That's right. Well, after you graduated from West High School, you went directly to the university here, or what uh, did you do? Almost. Uh, mm -hmm. I was uh, in the uh, next to the last mid-year graduating class at West High, graduating in January of 1936. There didn't appear to be much sense in uh, starting the university in the second semester with all the university classes geared to year-long uh, uh, programs. So uh, that second semester of the 1936-37, 35-36 uh, 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 school year, I uh, attended uh, uh, the old vocational school for a few months, taking uh, typing and shorthand and speech that I hadn't been able to work into my uh, uh, college preparatory curriculum in high school. And then as soon as it got warm enough, I uh, uh, spent the uh, spring and summer plowing marshes during the dry 30s, 1936, uh, over much of southern Wisconsin with a big, uh, a relatively big uh, uh, plow and a, a small crawler tractor that we would plow uh, on the marshes uh, where we, as long as we could keep moving uh, in the marsh, we could do pretty well. 
you were lucky to have a job. That was the depression. That was the depression. Mm -hmm. I kept my paper routes all the way through, uh, well, clear through university and law school, uh, getting somebody else to peddle the papers while I was working down at the State Journal office, uh, working my way through the university and mm -hmm. law school. All right. Then um, you graduated from the University Law School. Do you, which in, year? In uh, June of 1942, had had uh, quite a race with my draft board the last uh, eight months of my law school career, and so I went immediately into uh, uh, the uh, Army Air Force. Uh, was in a photo mapping squadron, uh, and eventually then took uh, uh, pilot training, uh, aviation cadet training and did graduate as a pilot in October of 1943. Bill, what particularly do you remember about being in the Air Force or about World War II days? Anything about World War II? Well, uh, you would recall that uh, the United States was anything but well prepared uh, for entry into World War II. So when we did get in, they put on a training program around the clock, and this uh, photo mapping squadron of which I was a member out at uh, Colorado Springs, uh, or at uh, first at uh, Denver, we went to school from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m., five days a week. Of course, we're always dog-tired because we'd have to be up during the daytime to change sheets and uh, get shots and whatever else was involved, so we weren't getting much sleep. But uh, I did finish that photo mapping squadron and then was stationed at uh, Colorado Springs for oh, a couple of months uh, during the fall of 1942 before uh, uh, my uh, eyes had improved with more regular uh, routine uh, my eyes had improved enough so that I was able to uh, pass the uh, eye part of the uh, aviation cadet uh, uh, examination and then uh, did go into aviation cadets uh, in uh, uh, Texas, uh, uh, took my flight training uh, in uh, Texas and Oklahoma and graduated as a pilot uh, in October of 1943 then was stationed for 15 months as a pilot of student navigators or navigation trainees at Monroe, Louisiana. So I would fly east, west, or north four hours, wait for it to get dark, uh, uh, come back at night, uh, letting the students uh, navigate by the stars on their trip uh, back to Louisiana. And uh, was then uh, in 1945 went into B-29 flight engineering training and was uh, uh, had finished the uh, flight engineering training and was in phase training when the atomic bombs were dropped in August of 1945 and of course the whole uh, war program folded up almost overnight uh, once those occurred. So then I came back to Madison uh, and uh, began to practice law uh, here in the in October of 1945. You went into practice by yourself. Yes. And you have been in, in private practice always, haven't you? Uh, for all practical purposes, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. In uh, in 1945, I, I had no connections with any established law firms that uh, would be willing to hire me. And of course, they had to preserve what space they had available for their returning veterans uh, once they were getting out of service. And so I just rented a, an office for $10 a month uh, from another lawyer and uh, shared offices with him, did my own typing because of course I couldn't afford a typist, and uh, began to practice that way, gradually building up my mm -hmm. practice and eventually uh, able to afford to hire a secretary and buy more books and so forth. Well, that has a very familiar ring <laughs> in our household, too. Right. And I think, uh, I'm sure you have been very happy in your practice, as Ken has been, oh, and yes. exceedingly gratified 
Ben. Certainly a, a, a wide variety of uh, activity and interest. Uh, I've enjoyed a great deal uh, knowing of his practice and uh, uh, conferring with him, swapping yarns at our famous <laughs> right. Thursday property group meetings. Right. That would be a tape recording in itself, I think, that Thursday group. Right. All right. Well, now um, you did had something to do with the legal aspects of our state legislative redistricting. Uh, would you tell us the background of that? Yes. All of my life I've been a, a population nut. Uh, and when you combine that with geography, it uh, works out best in legislative reapportionment. So beginning with, uh, oh, I would say probably the 1950 uh, census and each uh, 10 years since that time, I've been involved one way or another with legislative redistricting, either uh, doing much of it on my own or representing the Secretary of State in a suit uh, brought by the Attorney General, who of course couldn't represent both sides of the controversy. So I was special counsel to Secretary of State Zimmerman by appointment from uh, Governor Lucy. Uh, in after the 1970 uh, redistricting, uh, 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 the census of 1970, uh, handled uh, reapportionment of uh, city wards uh, as well as uh, legislative districts and congressional districts. I have worked with the population statistics in one way or another now for some 40 years. You still are then? Oh yes, uh, yes and with the the new census about to occur and the likelihood that Wisconsin will lose one congressional seat this year, I will uh, be working again to try to come up with as nearly square uh, congressional districts as uh, the uh, population statistics permit. Mm -hmm. All right. That um, leads very logically into many of your activities, and I'm sure your legal background has helped a great deal. Now, you were on the city council. I Do you recall the dates? I, you yes. Do. All right. 1961 to 67. I was elected to the city council in April of 61, uh, the same day that... Uh, my longtime friend and much admired uh, um, trucking um, activist uh, Henry Reynolds was elected mayor, so we worked uh, together along with several of his other supporters during the four years that he was mayor of Madison from 61 to 65. We were both elected on a uh, platform in opposition to the highly controversial Monona Terrace Auditorium project because the bids for that project had come in just a couple of months earlier at thirteen and a half million dollars when we had only about five and a half million dollars appropriated with which to build the project. Can you uh, elaborate a little on that project? The cost but is very obvious. That, right. uh, but um, now this is the Frank Lloyd Wright design project. Right. He and had, he had uh, conceived the idea, I think, back in the 30s when he was proposing uh, this uh, project more uh, as a city hall, I think, originally than as a uh, uh, an auditorium project. But the city hall uh, was combined with the courthouse uh, to form the what we now call the city county building in 1957. So uh, uh, his project, his dream, lay dormant for a good many years, but it was revived in the 50s, and uh, in 1950 the voters approved uh, $4 million for an auditorium and another million and a half for the parking project, the uh, parking structure in conjunction with it, a total of five and a half million dollars, but when those bids came in at uh, 13 million dollars, the voters rejected the the undertaking, and that was what got Henry Reynolds elected mayor and me elected to the city council, along with several other uh, anti-right people. I should add that 
I would have liked to have a Frank Lloyd Wright auditorium. Uh, the the idea, the concept, uh, the uh, notoriety would have been wonderful if we could have afforded it. But uh, I, to this day, have not learned of any project that Wright designed that ever came within the budget. And uh, where a Johnson Wax Company can write off uh, big expenses with uh, depreciation, the uh, public agency, such as the city of Madison, just has no way of doing that. Um, you also worked very hard, I know, on the open housing ordinance. And I think you have some articles here, don't you? And facts yeah. and scrapbooks and yes. that Betty has helped you with, the scrapbook collector. Um, will you tell us about the open housing ordinance and any of your recollections about working to achieve it? The people, the problems, anything. Right. The spring and summer of 1963, we were uh, agitating toward adoption of an open housing ordinance, but the original proposal ran many pages, so many pages that nobody took it very seriously. And finally, uh, uh, a group of uh, lawyers and professors boiled down the proposal to a workable uh, length, and we did get that uh, adopted uh, in uh, the fall of 1963. Uh, just for the record, you and I know what you're talking about when you say open housing ordinance, but somebody many years hence may not. Right. right. The, the, I, the concept was to uh, uh, prohibit discrimination uh, as regards the uh, occupancy, the sale or occupancy or uh, renting of property on the basis of uh, color. So uh, uh, we happened at that time to live in Westmoreland, which had had racial covenants uh, in the deeds in, in uh, the Westmoreland area. People didn't pay very much attention to them, and almost never was anybody uh, of uh, Asian or uh, black uh, background uh, prevented from living there. But uh, it was always a, a matter of, of some controversy. So in uh, 1963, we undertook to adopt this uh, open housing, uh, uh, freedom of uh, housing opportunity uh, ordinance. It was fascinating to me that the vote, uh, as, as it finally occurred in the fall of 1963, in November, I think, of 1963, was 11 to 11, an even split of the Madison City Council with the generally otherwise conservative aldermen uh, supporting the open housing ordinance and with a few exceptions, the opposition to the open housing ordinance coming from the otherwise usually liberal uh, aldermen. They were, uh, generally speaking, uh, more or their constituents were more afraid of the possibility that uh, uh, black people or other uh, ethnic minorities would be moving in next to them or something of a sort. And the uh, tie vote was broken by this otherwise ultra-conservative Henry Reynolds, uh, the mayor, who had grown up with... Uh, uh, black people in his neighborhood down on East Mifflin Street had gotten along fine with them, had hired uh, many of them uh, uh, or their families uh, to work uh, for him in his transfer business. And uh, uh, he helped put the ordinance across that we adopted. I should add that it happened at precisely that moment that we were moving from our old house in Westmoreland to this then new one that we had built in 1963 and the two mail carriers had to forward 600 pieces of mail that we got uh, uh, in regard to the open housing ordinance almost equally divided pro and con from your particular from my district mm -hmm. uh, uh, from from people in the Madison area but largely from within my own uh, constituency yes. right um, 19th Ward, right? It was right. at that time. Is, uh, that, uh, is it still 19th? Or? It is still the 19th mm -hmm. Ward, but the boundaries have changed uh, drastically. 
See, mm -hmm. the 19th Ward back in those days uh, included the Westmoreland area and this area to the west, which had not been anywhere near as developed as it has been more recently. Okay. Well, um, can you think of any particularly exciting or crucial times during the debate? Or any humorous things? I don't suppose there was much humor connected with this. <laughs> yes, along about that same time, uh, there was uh, a tavern operated by a black named Trotter down on uh, West Washington Avenue near Park Street. He did a pretty good job of operating his tavern there in what came to be known as the Urban Renewal Area. But uh, uh, because the city was taking over the property, it was necessary for him to find a new location. So Mayor Reynolds helped line up a place for him to buy out on uh, uh, Old Park Street, uh, now called Belled Street, out near the uh, uh, Wingra Creek. And uh, we ultimately uh, transferred the location of his tavern there. But the neighbors complained very strenuously about how they, uh, they didn't want any more taverns in the area. They were not racially prejudiced, uh, no, it was just that there were too many taverns in the area. Well, the night that we finally formally approved the, the transfer, uh, it was done with simply approving the uh, vote of the activities of two nights before without calling attention to the particular item. But it turned out there were a good many people there in the audience who weren't familiar with council proceedings. And when one of the aldermen uh, noticed a particular person there that had uh, been there a few nights before, he called the mayor's attention to it. And the mayor said, why, yes, if you people in the audience uh, didn't know, we approved the uh, Trotter Tavern uh, relocation uh, 20 minutes ago in the Committee of the Whole report, whereupon all bedlam broke loose <laughs> in the council chambers with uh, uh, people, the uh, gallery calling us uh, all kinds of uh, ethnic uh, insults and <laughs> so forth for having uh, approved this. And then, of course, the true the true uh, reasons behind the uh, opposition uh, came out when they lost their tempers after the transfer had been approved. Do you think uh, there's any discrimination now in housing? Do you hear of events that used to be in the newspaper, we'd read something, but I don't think I hear so much. Maybe you hear more than I do. Uh, I, I am convinced that there are still strains of uh, racial or religious uh, prejudice that are involved, usually not head-on. Uh, usually the, the purchaser is unable to get the necessary financing and get himself off the hook uh, because of the lack of financing. I do recall one instance where we uh, insisted on proceeding with the purchase when the, uh, uh, with the sale where the purchaser was trying desperately to back out because he had discovered a black family over the back fence of the property that he had contracted to buy. It so happened that the uh, black neighbor was a chemist at the Oscar Mayer company, was earning at least twice as much as the, as the uh, objecting uh, white purchaser, but uh, we insisted on going ahead with it and closed the deal. I have long since lost all touch with it. Probably worked out all right. Right. Well, um, anything else about the city council you want to say or being an alderman? Or should we proceed to another topic? Oh, I, uh, one thing that I think uh, comes up from time to time even at the present time as we talk about downtown skywalks even at the present time. Morgan Manchester operated the Manchester's department store uh, for many years. He acquired the former Barron Brothers store in the middle of the block, a half a block away. On he, Mifflin Street. On, on Mifflin Street, on Capitol Square. Uh, he wanted to uh, build a skywalk to connect the two projects, but that would have obstructed the view of the Capitol from Wisconsin Avenue and the Lake Mendota area, the Edgewater Hotel area. So I was strenuously opposed to it, and the city council uh, 
uh, voted it down, we were perfectly willing to allow him to have a tunnel under Wisconsin Avenue mm -hmm. connecting the two stores, but he opposed that. And Uh, Bill, I'm sure that in all of your council activities, you worked with many citizens. Are there any that you particularly recall in any of these endeavors, like the housing ordinance or the Monona Terrace Project or any others? Yes, certainly tops among my council acquaintances was uh, Colonel Harrison Garner. Long time, uh, he, he was uh, alderman from Madison's... Uh, Fifth Ward for 35 years, far and away the longest period of time anybody ever served on the Madison City Council. He was a real gentleman uh, with whom to work, but I felt that he was the genius behind the development of the Anchor Savings and Loan Association. Other people got credit for it or took credit for it, but uh, Harrison Garner really helped build the Anchor Savings and Loan Association. And actually, uh, it was partly because of serving with him on the Madison City Council that I was able to persuade uh, him and uh, the uh, anchor board to undertake the construction of a retirement home at Whitewater, the uh, uh, Fairhaven project at Whitewater, that ultimately uh, we got put together uh, in 1961 to three uh, and with the uh, construction work there and I think it has been the most successful uh, loan project that Anchor has ever had but uh, largely under the leadership of uh, Harrison Garner and some of the other directors Al Gallistel, the director of physical plant planning at the university was also a member of the uh, Anchor board and was one of the leaders in undertaking that project what about uh, people who helped you with various other things, like the housing ordinance? Uh, one of the uh, strongest supporters of the uh, fair housing ordinance was uh, Ethel Brown, a wife of uh, Professor Ray Brown of the University Law School. Uh, they lived on Elm Street in University Heights, uh, right close to West High School. And uh, uh, she was certainly one of the best prepared older people I ever knew. She was not flamboyant and uh, uh, aggressive at all, but she worked very, very uh, skillfully behind the scenes, uh, lining up votes for the projects that she wanted to undertake. And it was, it was a real joy to work with her. Many, many other aldermen as well, but certainly uh, she and Colonel Garner were among my favorites. How about the... Uh when she had that meeting to get the uh, votes together for the equal opportunity. Oh, yes. Uh, Mrs. Brown did uh, have a neighborhood meeting uh, there, I, I think at their home near West High School, uh, lining up uh, support both from uh, constituents and also from uh, uh, aldermen to undertake uh, support of the open housing ordinance. The uh, uh, ordinance itself had been, uh, I mentioned before, had been so originally so cumbersome that nobody took it very seriously. But uh, Jim McDonald and uh, then attorney Shirley Abrahamson, now Justice uh, Abrahamson, undertook to boil down the verbiage uh, to a workable form that we could then adopt and it was that, uh, that revised form that we adopted uh, in 1963. I should add that one of the things that uh, Mrs. Brown succeeded in accomplishing, she was concerned uh, with her constituents up in University Heights uh, renting rooms to university students. Uh, she was uh, concerned that uh, it would be hard to convince people to uh, open their homes to people of all races and colors uh, uh, where they would have to share the same bathroom. And so she did succeed in uh, modifying the ordinance to the extent of, uh, of having the new ordinance not apply to 
rooming houses with uh, um, single bathrooms or something of the sort uh, in order to uh, reflect the, uh, the attitudes, the feelings of her constituents uh, there. I think that helped to uh, line up the 11th vote that was necessary to get the ordinance adopted. Well, thank you. That's really very interesting, and I think people who take our open housing for granted many years will be particularly interested in that. Well, you have had a lot of, uh, I guess controversial is the word, topics to handle, and you've been very active politically. Now, that isn't always tame, and I know <laughs> that you have been active in the Republican Party, um, are there any highlights you want to recall, or we did mention in the introduction changes in philosophy or personnel or crises or anything you'd like to recall about it? Well, about yes, I, I have tended over the years to be uh, uh, among the uh, more moderate uh, Republicans. I was a very strong supporter of Wendell Wilkie and Harold Stassen before him. Uh, have uh, been an enthusiastic uh, supporter of uh, George Romney when he was running for president. And so I have not always set uh, very well with the more conservative Republicans. I did run for Congress in 1966 as the Republican candidate but uh, was uh, uh, ineligible for consideration to run again in 1968 uh, because I was supporting, or uh, particularly my wife, was supporting George Romney when he was running for president. And that just didn't go well at all with the ultra-conservative county chairman from uh, Monroe. I did want to comment that we do have a tape, uh, an interview with your wife, Betty, and I'm sure people will want to play these together because Betty served on the council, was a candidate for mayor, a candidate for Congress, so there's a lot of parallelism here. I don't suppose you can agree 100% of the time. Would, I think that would be impossible in any household. <laughs> but I do think that parallelism will be interesting to people who listen to both of these tapes, and I'm sure that they will be listened to together. All right. Now, you ran for Congress. Uh, whom did you run against? Against uh, Kastenmeyer after he, Bob Kastenmeyer had been there for uh, 10 years at that time. So uh, this was 1966. No, it was eight years at that time. He was first elected in 1958. All right. Um, I keep bringing up changes. Do you want to comment or don't you particularly see great changes or... Oh, yes. I, I think that uh, we, we have uh, improved our uh, outlook on a good many issues. Back uh, 40 years ago, the Republican Party was pretty much a party of isolationism. Now it uh, uh, tends to be a, a party of uh, internationalism. And this uh, happens at least to a considerable extent because of the conversion of Senator Arthur Vandenberg of Michigan, who uh, until the Second World War was an arch isolationist, but uh, became a strong supporter of uh, international cooperation during and after the Second World War. And I, I see the Republican Party having followed many of his uh, uh, attitudes, his changes of outlook as well. Right. Well, now you've been active in your church, too. I keep calling it the Congregational Church, and I suppose I always will. And uh, for people who don't know, the first Congregational Church is the church on the corner of Breeze Terrace and University Avenue. Right. And what is its name now, Bill? Uh, First Congregational United Church of Christ. I've been a member there since 1931, so that's, uh, what, 58, uh, uh, 58 years uh, ago. Goodness. And uh, was active in uh, the local church administration, but in the state layman's fellowship and the 
National Layman's Fellowship, was president of the National Layman's Fellowship for three years, 60, I guess 58 to 61, something of that sort. And uh, worked uh, very strenuously in the merger of the old Congregational Christian denomination and the Evangelical Reformed Church into what we now call the United Church of Christ. When was that? Uh, that was uh, from 1950 on, but the 1957 was the first uh, uh, combined synod, and uh, then uh, since that time it has operated as the uh, combined uh, denomination instead of the two separate ones. Right. Um, does this go back to your Mayflower heritage? Yes, yes. Uh, the Congregationalists, of course, were, uh, were founded here in this country by the Pilgrims in 1620, and uh, so it was uh, a logical uh, development uh, in the merger. The, the old Congregationalists had merged with one of the several so-called Christian denominations in 1931, I think, and uh, then in 19. 50 and the next 10 years in the merger uh, with the Evangelical Reformed into the United Church. Now we've talked about Fairhaven in Whitewater and you did mention anchor savings and loans role in financing it. Can you tell us about the concept there, the size of the project? And uh, yes, we, uh, I had undertaken the, to negotiate the purchase of the land down the center of a very long, narrow block in Whitewater in 1955. We uh, undertook to obtain the financing for it, but expected to uh, work through the Federal Housing Administration in about a $2 million construction project. It so happened that uh, the financing was to be undertaken by the highly respected uh, B.C. Ziegler Company of West Bend, one of the leading um, church institutional uh, finance uh, developers uh, in the country. But uh, the president of the Ziegler Company uh, in 1960 was Del Kenny, a very conservative Republican, who when uh, Jack Kennedy was elected uh, president in the fall of 1960, I'm convinced that uh, that particular project would have been the last FHA uh, <laughs> housing project approved anywhere in the country uh, by the new administration. So in uh, 1961, when I was elected to the city council and got to work with Harrison Garner, we persuaded them uh, to undertake a million dollar loan. Uh, it is a, an absolute fact that the death of the finest Christian practitioner, the, the most practicing Christian I've ever known, sign painter G.I. Wallace here in Madison, uh, contributed very substantially to the uh, Fairhaven uh, retirement uh, construction. Because in, uh, oh, probably 1962 or thereabouts, we had lined up this million dollar loan from Anchor, but the board of the Fairhaven project rejected the loan. Uh, how will we get the rest of the money? How can we go ahead and pay $6,200 a month uh, for the project and so forth? I came back to Madison a confirmed atheist. I was all through doing good for anybody, uh, but G.I. Wallace, this uh, sign painter who was such a practicing Christian was really responsible for the construction of the central colony for the developmentally disabled. Uh, he died very suddenly and after attending his funeral I called the chairman of the Madison General Hospital Board of uh, Directors, uh, George Hall, to suggest a successor to G.I. Wallace on the uh, hospital board and Mr. Hall thanked me for the suggestion. They ultimately did elect the uh, individual who served with great distinction. But Mr. Hall said, but 
tell me what what's happened. You told me a few weeks ago that you had lined up the purchase or the the, the financing of that retirement project down at Whitewater. You know, we were going to be the plumbing, heating, and air conditioning subcontractor on it, but now I hear that it's off. Well, I let my hair down and uh, told him uh, how frustrated I was. The upshot of it was that he arranged with the general contractor, Mr. Willis in Janesville, to meet with the uh, congregational superintendent, Reverend Nornberg, and me, and we uh, succeeded in working out the details to have the project uh, uh, underwritten. After all, we did get another $100,000 in the loan from Anchor, and Mr. Willis delayed receiving his final $100,000 and Mr. Hall his final $50,000. So among the bunch of those, we uh, created uh, uh, another quarter of a million dollars for the project, but only because of the death of G.I. Wallace and suggesting a successor to him on the Madison General Hospital Board of Directors. Mm -hmm. Um, now, is this retirement and nursing facilities? Uh, yes. Uh, it was constructed originally with some uh, nursing facilities in the central unit, uh, the uh, elevator uh, part of uh, the uh, central unit, and has continued to maintain nursing facilities as well as individual apartments there. has been expanded on repeatedly, has... Uh, except for the uh, university in Whitewater, which, of course, is the biggest thing in Whitewater. Fairhaven is, by all odds, the second most important uh, part of the Whitewater community. Well, I know some Madison people are happy that, it, that it exists and that they can go there to live. And I've always heard wonderfully complimentary things about Fairhaven. So that's a real contribution. Well, um, to summarize now, um, both you and I are Madison natives. We've seen many changes. Are there changes that you would want to comment on, either just physically or what stands out in your mind, uh, attitude, tone of the city, um, anything at all? Oh, there are lots of things that could have been done, should have been done, as we look back on it. Uh, uh, among the many dreams that I was never able to put together, I, I wanted to uh, try to vacate Johnson Street and University Avenue through the campus district and just keep the north-south streets for connector purposes, but run a high-speed freeway alongside of the railroad track uh, clear downtown. Uh, south of the campus, but I was never able to line up enough support on the city council to accomplish that. Another item that should have been done back uh, in the 1950s and 60s, uh, Madison could have had a loop of the interstate highway system uh, through the isthmus uh, to move uh, much more traffic than just uh, the the. Uh, uh, interstate highway on the uh, east and north side of Madison, but the city didn't undertake to do so. Uh, another project that I used to try to dream of was, was to see whether we could operate a rail bus service uh, in Madison using the existing railroad lines, but I wrote the railroads to try to persuade them to uh, either operate such a rail service themselves or permit the formation of a, a separate um, rail bus service that would uh, accomplish that, but they just weren't uh, willing to have their tracks tied up with uh, that kind of uh, commuter traffic, and so we never did succeed in getting that accomplished either. Well, I think, too, in addition to these physical and traffic situations, I'm always proud of Madison whenever I talk about it, because of our many offerings culturally, educationally, and I keep thinking, I'm not, I don't have the background you do, I keep thinking we have clean government, and I think we're exceedingly fortunate. Good educational system, um, lots of dedicated citizens like you, and I think you're probably equally proud. 
Well, yes, but you you should realize that the temptations do exist. I will always remember one instance in which a notorious tavern down on State Street was moved to the near east side, and after it had been done, the alderman into whose ward the transfer had occurred received a hand-picked uh, uh, letter from the attorney for the tavern keeper uh, thanking him for his help in uh, uh, relocating the tavern and enclosing a $50 bill in cash that the alderman was so horrified he didn't know what to do with it. He got hold of uh, Mayor Reynolds and me and we had him just return the $50 bill uh, by certified mail. Uh, but uh, those, those temptations do occur uh, right along and uh, uh, hopefully they will usually be resisted. Well, thank you. And I have appreciated this opportunity, Bill. Well, I've enjoyed it. Good. And thank you again. That's it.